and you can find those lists all over the web. I decided to go at this a little differently. I'm going to work through a couple of um, small but non-trivial examples just to give you an idea of how Groovy can be used. And by doing that, I'll be able to bring up features and show you how things work. Now, in some of the applications, I was not able to grab all the source code to show it in the slides, but all the source code that I have will be made available to you. Uh, we'll go through Dave on that. I'll make sure that you can get it anywhere you like. I'll probably uh, uh, give it to him as a, an archive or maybe check it into a source code repository or whatever we like. But any code that, that I have available or that I talk about here, you're, you're more than welcome to. Okay. So this is a rough idea of what we're going to do. I'll, I'll give you just a tiny bit of background about me, and then we'll talk a bit about Groovy. But again, I don't want to get bogged down in motivating all this. I figure if you're here, you probably already have some reason that you're interested in Groovy. I'd rather get into the actual code. Developers like to see code and show you how Groovy makes life simpler, especially for Java developers, where all of that comes in. All right, what is Groovy? Groovy is actually a programming language. It is a separate language, but it's one of a family of languages that has a unique uh, relationship to Java. The idea is that Groovy code compiles to Java bytecodes. So even though you're writing in a different language, when you actually compile the code, it turns into bytecodes that run on the JVM. And this means that it works really easily with Java and works on your existing infrastructure. For example, deployment of Groovy code is exactly the same as deployment of Java code. And as a matter of fact, you can easily mix Groovy and Java together. You just add another jar file to your distribution, and then everything works fine. We'll talk a bit more about that as we go along. Of all the, the languages that compile to the JVM, Groovy is by far the easiest one for Java developers to learn. It has a very Java-like syntax to it. It just simplifies things considerably. And I'll be showing you that as we go along. There are other languages that compile to the JVM that have various degrees of popularity. You may have heard, things, heard of languages like Scala or Clojure or even JRuby for running Ruby code on the JVM. But Groovy was never intended to replace Java. Groovy is intended to supplement Java, to extend it and expand it and make it easier. It also lets us use these modern language features like closures and builders and metaprogramming. Some of these things I'll, I'll talk about. People have said Groovy is what Java would have looked like had it been invented in the 21st century. All right, enough of that. Let's actually run some Groovy. So what I'm doing here is I'm showing you some of the code. I also have available, let's see if that shows up okay. This is Spring Source Tool Suite. It's an Eclipse-based tool. There's a Groovy plugin for Eclipse, but I happen to like Spring Source Tool Suite because it also handles uh, Grails applications very nicely. But I just thought I'd bring that up, and I'm hoping that font is big enough. Actually, now that I think about it, let me make that font one size uh, bigger here just to make it a little bit easier to see. Uh, let me go up to 20 point. That ought to do it. And I'll close that and reopen it just to make sure. So there's the Groovy Hello World program. It's very different from Java, of course. Java, you have to put everything in a class. Java, you have to have a main method in that class if you're going to run an application. Groovy is able to, it does lots of classes too, which we'll look at, but it also does just plain old scripts. So here we see a regular program, a script, and it's using print line. And in fact, that print line is a method. It doesn't look like a method because you don't see any parentheses. But in Groovy, parentheses are optional if it's obvious what's going on. Here they're supplying a string to the print line method. You also don't see any semicolons here. Semicolons are also optional. Now let me just run this just to prove that it does what, I, what I'm saying it, it does. And as soon as I execute it, you see there's our printout of Hello World. Now, when you install Groovy, it comes with a nice console that you can use uh, that's graphical and, and helpful, and it lets you test out scripts and things like that. Or, as I say, there are a variety of editors. There are modes that are supported in all the major IDEs, like Eclipse here, uh, STS, uh, NetBeans has Groovy support. And I believe uh, many of the core team members use IntelliJ's IDEA, which has excellent Groovy and Grail support. So the bottom line on that little script is, first of all, hey, it's only a script. Now, of course, this has got to run on the JVM. So it does have to get converted to bytecodes. If I took a, the Java P command, which interrogates bytecodes and tries to say, what are the classes and what are the methods, you would find that it would take that script 
and wrap it inside a main method and extend a class in Groovy called script or something like that, and it's all happening under the hood. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, so one of the target audiences for Groovy would be people who do things in scripting languages because this would give you the opportunity to write scripts in Java-like languages and integrate in with Java-like systems if you need to do that. It's all object-oriented and everything. So I mentioned the optional parentheses and the optional semicolons. I also happen to use deliberately this time single quoted strings. Single quotes uh, are used for strings and double quotes are used for strings as well. There is a difference which we'll see in a moment. So that was the simplest of all possible applications. I mean, by law, I suppose every, every language has to show a hello world application. Let me look at something a little bit more interesting. Now this will be a simple one and then I'll show a more complicated one. Uh, I want to access what these days we would probably call a kind of restful web service. I mean, it's not a full web service. You can't add anything, but it's a, it's a read-only web service. And what it is is it's Google Chart. Now, Google Chart has its API. It's located at this URL. And you're able to create a, a URL string where you append data in the parameters, and Google returns a plot of the results. Now, I think I have this uh, set up here. Um, this is the Google Chart homepage that I was mentioning and if I go into the getting started page they show the elements of charts and you can see uh, the first example of course is a hello world example now I echoed this in our slides here this is an access to Google chart now of course this would all be on one line so you send your request to this URL chart.apis.google.com slash chart question mark and the rest of these things are all parameters so, for example, CHS is the size of the chart in pixels. CHD is the data. This is uh, text data in between 0 and 100. CHT here is the type. In this case, I'm asking for a three-dimensional pie chart. And CHL would be the labels. You see labels are separated by a vertical bar. So if you were to actually send this URL to, uh, put, just type it in your browser, basically, this is what you get back. Here's the Hello World example. As a matter of fact, on that documentation page, this chart right here is actually, if you do a view source, they don't embed an image. They actually put in the URL and evaluate it. It's the source, the image, uh, or rather the URL is embedded in the source attribute of an image tag is how that shows. And they have lots of different kinds of charts, you know, various components and uh, tons of uh, different types. So let me do this sort of thing in Groovy, just to show you an example of how you could access a remote web service and then do something with the results. So I'm going to start off with a script that starts like this. Now the word def here means that we're declaring a variable, but we're not determining what type it is. Or we're not committing to a type. It could be a string, could be a float, could be a double, could be uh, the return value of a method. It could be anything. It means define, but we are going with what, we're, what they call in Groovy optional typing. So we don't have to pick a data type. We can if we want. Ruby has optional typing. If I say string base, that's fine too. Uh, but if you don't care or you don't, you're not sure what you want to do with it yet, then you generally start off with def. So here what I've done is I've put the URL for Google Chart inside single quote. So this is essentially a string. If I was to ask the base variable what type are you pointing to, it would say it's a string right now. Now here, I want to send those parameters. I want to append onto that URL you know, a, a series of key equals value, ampersand, key equals value, ampersand, key equals value properties. So rather than just hard code them in, I'm taking the opportunity to show you how you can assemble something like this. Params here is a map. Now, if you've used Java at all, then you know you'd have to instantiate a map, probably a hash map or maybe a, a, a different one that you might want to use. And then you'd have to call the put method to put in all the keys and the values and plug them all in. Well, in Groovy, I can just write out my map. So I just wrote out these CHT, CHS, CHD, CHL. Those are all the keys that will be in the map. And then here are all the values. And those are the same ones from the Hello World example that I just showed on the previous slide with the uh, URL. Once I have the map, I'm going to now assemble my query one moment because that's coming in the next slide. So for this slide, I want to say def means we have a variable that has not yet been declared to have a particular type. Uh, double quoted strings, I'll talk about in a moment, are used for parameter re replacement. So breaking this down a little bit more, there's the map. 
Okay, there's params and it's a map of uh, keys and values. If you actually ask Groovy, you know, if I did a regular Java uh, get class dot get name, it would tell us that this is an instance of linked hash map. So this is one thing I want to mention. First of all, how easy it is to do collections in Groovy as opposed to Java. But secondly, how Groovy does not reinvent the wheel, or I like to call that reinvent the flat tire, which is what happens when you reinvent the wheel and you get it wrong. Uh, it uses the Java library. So if the Java libraries are available, it takes advantage of them. There's no need to re-implement everything in Groovy. This is one of the best features of Groovy, is that if you have an existing Java library or an existing infrastructure or any code you've already written in Java, then you can use that without any changes whatsoever, and you can add Groovy to that in a different class, and then in your Groovy class, you can use Java classes right inside the source code without any problem at all. So this, simply writing this statement, instantiates a li linked hash map and puts in all the values there. Keys and values are separated by colons, and the entries are separated by commas. Now about that collect method. This is one of the methods that has been added to the map interface by Groovy. Groovy has what they call a GDK, where instead of the JDK, you can go in and see what methods have been added to existing Java classes to provide convenient functionality. One of these methods is called collect, and one of the arguments it's taking is this thing in curly braces, which we're going to call a closure. Now, if you've heard of closures and you've only used languages that don't use closures, or if you've only used closures in JavaScript, then you're, you can be safely, uh, it'd be understandable if you were a little worried about that. Closures can be very confusing, and what's a true closure and what isn't is debatable, and yeah, Java's thinking of adding closures to JDK 7, and then they go back and forth on it. It's all kinds of issues. Here's the easy way to think about it in Groovy. It's not precise, but it's, it's workable. A closure is basically an executable block of code that we can treat as an object. So instead of having to make, say, anonymous inner classes, you know, I mean, in other words, in order to use a method as an object, we have to wrap it in a class. We always have to do that. There's a, uh, there's a whole discussion about how um, the, the idea in Java is that everything must belong inside of a, a class. You know, the nouns have triumphed over the verbs here. The verbs are the methods, and the verbs can't be treated on their own. Now, this harkens back to the idea of function pointers in C++ or, or other things that you might be familiar with. But for our purposes, the idea of being able to handle a method by itself is very, very helpful. Now, what this syntax means is that they are applying this collect to a map, and the k, comma, v are dummy variables to represent the key and the value. And then this arrow says, here, that's just separating the dummy variables from what we want to do with them. Well, what we want to do with them is for each one of the entries in the map, we want to create this little double-quoted string and plug in the value of key and plug in the value of the value here and separate them by an equal sign. So in other words, it takes that map from before, and the collect method applies this closure to every entry in params and returns a list. So here is a list. Now, a list in Groovy, again, is, uh, looks like a map, except it doesn't have the colons in it. It's square brackets, and you can put the values in separated by commas. That would be an instance of uh, java.util.arraylist. This business with the double quoted strings is called uh, substitution. You use the dollar sign, or if it's more than just a single little parameter, you'd use a dollar sign in curly braces to evaluate what's in the curly braces and substitute that into the string. They call these groovy strings or, unfortunately, um, G strings. Uh, I know that whoever came up with that has probably regretted it ever since, but there we are. So, moving on. So that whole the, the uh, part of the code up to this point returns that, that list containing strings. Now they've added a join method to the list interface that will connect, that will join all of the elements of the list and separate them by some delimiter. So this is a method added to the list interface and implemented in array list and all the other collections. And when we invoke join with the ampersand, now we get all the parameters connected separated by ampersands and the required URL I need is simply that base URL plus the stuff we just saw you know plus this business the uh, CHT etc the query string pardon me Ken. Oh, yes sir uh, question in the queue from one mm -hmm. of our students today and that question is whoops I uh, just lost it here 
that question is, can we replace the K and V with some other characters? Yes. You can pick any, any values you want. They are, think of them as a method call. Those are parameters in a method call. So they're just dummy variables. Anything that uh, fits, I like to use K and V because it means key and value to me and it's uh, very terse. But anything, Thank you so much. Anything else or should I go on? Okay, I'll continue then. Uh, so far, everything we've done here is just manipulating strings. You know, I mean, I put together a collection and I assembled everything together and now I've got the URL. Now I want to transmit it. Well, one of the methods that's been added to the string class, because remember that URL is just a string, is called toURL. That converts it to a URL that actually can go over the web. And if I access a so-called text property, what that's actually doing is invoking a getText method and returns whatever is at that URL. So I don't have to go through all the trouble of making a new URL and doing an open connection and setting various headers and opening an input stream or an output stream and downloading everything I want. All I have to do is say get text or just use the text property, which is the same thing. And there I have all the results on that web page or everything that came back as a result of that method. This is very convenient for accessing RESTful web services. Now I say this is a text property. In fact, there's a get text method, and that's a normal convention for Groovy. If I have an object and I go dot property equals value, then in fact what it's doing is it's invoking the set property method with the value. And if I access it, I'm doing a get property here. And these methods, this get and set, are actually provided automatically at runtime. They're dynamically generated. You don't have to write any of those methods. You just have to declare the property. They happen automatically. Let me come back to that one when we talk about a Groovy beam. So I want to display this because it's one thing to make the nice little URL. I actually want to see what I got out of it. So I wrote this little program, and this, is use, this uses another groovy thing called a builder. The idea here in this builder is that we are going to create a Swing user interface. Now, if you've ever used Swing before, then you know how that can be very large and tedious and uh, complicated. But in Groovy, they have this thing, and they make it very, very simple. So first of all, I notice I've got a bunch of imports here, and then I've got some code down here. Now before, rather than go through it all on this slide, let me break it down and go through it piece by piece. So first of all, here are the import statements. And notice how it's a mix of Java imports and Groovy imports. You can freely use them together without a problem. Java, of course, if you've used Java at all, you know it imports java.lang automatically. We get that all the time. Groovy goes beyond that. It imports java.util, java.io, java.net, java.math.biginteger and bigdecimal, as well as groovy.lang and groovy.util. So you already cut way down on the number of import statements that you need in your program. So be it. Another Oops, question in the queue, Ken. Yes, sir. Do we have a groovy bean like a Java bean? Yes, we do. And we, that's a great segue. Uh, we'll be getting to that in about oh, five minutes or so. So Excellent. that's definitely Thank coming you. in. Yes. Great. Uh, Thanks. Okay. Now, another thing I did in the import statement, now there's the keyword in Groovy called as, and it actually has many uses, but here's one of them. Here I've imported Java, Java X dot swing dot window constants, and I want to refer to it in my code as just the abbreviation WC. I can make up any abbreviation I want. And for both of those, I'm just using the abbreviation. So when I go inside the build method, or actually anywhere in this file, I can just use WC or BL as representing, as aliases, if you will, for those classes. Now I'm going to use the class from Groovy, this groovy.swing.swingbuilder, and call its build method. And now everything in the curly braces will be evaluated by the builder. And let me show you what that looks like. Here's the build. Inside I have what looks like a method call, frame, and it's got parentheses and closed parentheses, and I have attributes and everything in there. Well, this is interpreted by the builder to create a J frame. And title here, these are being used as, they look like um, map parameters. Well, they're being interpreted as uh, attributes on the frame. So this goes frame.setTitle to be hello world and set visible to true and set the default close operation to there's that wc.exit on close. When I open up another set of curly braces, then I'm saying, okay, inside the frame I have a child element. And the child element I have is a label 
which is actually an instance of the J label class. Inside that, I want to say set icon to, and now we get a Java class, a new image icon wrapped around that URL and put it in the center of the platform and pack it as small as possible. So the result of this little piece of code here is a Swing user interface that accesses the URL uh, across the web, brings down the image, packs it in an image icon, puts the image icon inside a JFrame, and shows it. And we get, uh, we get a nice little behavior here. So let me actually run that. Here is my, here's my whole, this is the uh, code itself, just broke, you know, all in one place rather than in pieces as you saw it. Let me run that as just to prove that this is working. It's going to actually go out over the web and execute that code and come back with a user interface. The delay generally, oh, it came up on the wrong screen for me. Here's what came up. I can resize that, of course. I chose, uh, I called the pack method, so it got really small. But I can resize. You see the image. When I told the image that I only wanted 250 by 100 pixels, that's why we got that size. And the pack method put the J frame around it to suit. Uh, so there it is, and I can just close out of that. And there you see a very simple hello world access uh, of Google Chart. A couple of questions in the queue, Ken. Sure. Uh, first one is, can we suppress the auto creation of the get and set methods? What if I have a private variable that I don't want anyone to say set a value on? Yes, you can. There are a couple different ways to do it. First of all, if you provide your own getter or setter, then Groovy will not supply one. And you're free to provide one and make it private, for example. Or if you put in a variable and you make the variable final, of course it will not provide a setter method. So there are a couple different ways to go at that. Great. And another question, can we use as keyword also for Groovy imports? Yes. The as keyword is used for any import just to identify an alias for it. It's purely, if you've heard the term syntactic sugar, uh, syntactic sugar is just syntax that doesn't really change anything going on underneath, just makes it simpler that doesn't change the bytecodes in any way. When we say as, we're just making up a convenient name for us to use. The compiler is going to remove all that and replace it with the actual class anyway. Great. One last question for this segment. What mm -hmm. plugins do I need in Eclipse to do Groovy development? Uh, there's a single plugin. It's called a Groovy Eclipse plugin. Uh, I could give you the URL, but frankly, the easiest way to get it is to Google Groovy Eclipse plugin, and it'll take you right to the site, and there's an update string and you'll just uh, add it to your regular Eclipse update and it brings it in and works without any other changes. You can add, you can make Groovy projects that already have Groovy in there and you can also add Groovy capabilities to existing Java projects if you want to. I've done that on, like for example, there's no Groovy web project specifically. Instead I make a regular dynamic web project and just add the Groovy capabilities and now I can mix both Groovy and Java in the same app. Great. Thanks very much, Ken. Okay, so at any rate, there was our simple example, and of course the problem is once you start playing with graphics, it's hard to stop, so I eventually had to do this one. I have a much larger script. Uh, I, mentioned, I forgot to mention at the beginning, I'm working on a book for Manning called Groovy and Java, The Sweet Spots. I had a little graphic on the front, I just keep forgetting to mention it. That'll be coming out sometime this year, hopefully. Well, no, it'll, according to Manning, it will be, so I guess <laughs> uh, it'll be available for Meep sometime this summer. What was that? You've got no choice now. You've committed to this year, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, any rate, so I put together a little graphic of anticipated impact on our Groovy and Java book sales. There's the publication, and if it's mentioned in Groovy Mag, get the Joel Award and go on Letterman, and of course we'll put something in the Harry Potter movie and eventually wind up on Oprah's book club. You know, okay, this might be a little unrealistic. Then the negative side is the drunken ran on Larry King live and find bugs in the source code or infomercial with a sham wow guy. And, scandalous YouTube videos. So of course then eventually you have to do a tearful apology on the view and a manning behind the text special. So uh, I have the source code for putting together this bar chart too if you want any of that. That's just a little bit more elaborate from what we did before. I'm desperately hoping that my sense of humor bears some resemblance to yours as well. Now this is the point where I was going to switch to a bigger application, uh, talk about Groovy Baseball. I'll show you that in a moment. But uh, Dave, is this a moment when you wanted to speak for a moment? Sure. I'd like to take 30 seconds of everyone's time. Hold on. Oh, you want me to make you a presenter, don't you? Yes, please. 
Okay, there you go. Thanks. So just uh, to let everyone know in the group that uh, is attending today, uh, we do run both online and on-site training classes, and Ken will be teaching the Groovy and Growls and the Groovy for Java Developers classes, both online and if you have a group of people at your organization, we can come to your facility and teach you there. Um, so what you're seeing now is our Getting Started with Groovy and Growls 28-hour class, uh, and we also have a 28-hour 28 28-hour 28 online class and hands-on workshop called Groovy for Java Developers. So both these are coming up. You can visit these web pages, uh, visit skillbuilders.com and search on Groovy, or go under the Java curriculum and you'll find these classes. And you can see that, uh, for example, on July 19th through July 22nd, we'll be running this Groovy for Java Developers class. And those classes, folks, it's important to note that there's two-way audio. You'll be talking directly to Ken and asking your questions. And as you do workshops, Ken will be there to support you. So you have hands-on training, whether we do it online or on-site. And it's two-way audio if you do it online. We just don't have two-way audio today because of the amount of people that are on the call. So uh, we hope to see you in one of these future classes. Or if you have any projects that you're cranking up and you think we can help you with, let us know. With that, I'm going to pass it right back over to Ken. And I'm going to make you the presenter, Ken. And away we go. Thanks for your time, everybody. Okay, thank you. I know that this summary is going to be bringing up as many questions as it solves. Uh, I did have my email address at the beginning. If you wind up sending me email, I will try to answer you directly. Of course, it's, uh, it would work very well in the class, too. But let me go on and show you a somewhat bigger application, because I'd like to show you something a lot of people are always interested in, which is working with databases and generating XML and, and some other things. Now, to show you what this application looks like, uh, this is a picture of it, but I actually have it running on my site. Let's see. Here is Ruby Baseball. Uh, you select the date to see all the games that day. Um, it, here's a calendar widget, and if I pick, say, well, I don't know, let's pick the second here. And then what it's doing is it's going off to MLB.com, downloading an XML file, parsing it, building output for a Google map, and then here, for example, was the, the result of uh, the Tigers beating Cleveland 3 nothing uh, there, and I put little dots on the map just to show the results of all the different games. And as I say, you can pick any particular date that you want, and it's, I'm using a little bit of ajax -y goodness to make it so that I don't have to refresh the whole page. I can just refresh individual dates. And, of course, the calendar, you can go back to May or whatever, and it'll always get the new ones. So I don't have time to show you the entire application, but let me show you some of the heart of it. And if you're interested in seeing more details, I'd be happy to make the, the code available. So here's the thing. I want to put those dots on a map, so I need to know where the games are played. So I want to put the latitude. I need For Google Maps, you need the latitude and longitude of the home stadium, the stadium where the home team was. Google also has a RESTful web service called their GeoCoder, and you can find out what the latitude and longitudes are by sending an address, and it'll return that. Of course, stadiums don't move, so I might as well just save all those results in the database, and then when I fire up the application, it'll read the database when it starts up, read that table, and then we're ready to go, because there's nothing else that really needs to be saved in the database at this point. So first of all, I need a class to hold all this stuff. So I called it Stadium. It's got an ID and a name and the team abbreviation, the team that plays in it. And I put in doubles. I could have made them big integers. I could have made them or big, big decimals. I could have said def here. I just happened to pick types here for latitude and longitude. And I even put in this, by the way, is what a two-string override would look like in Groovy. I just don't need the public and private. Now, for the person who was asking about Groovy beans, this is a Groovy bean, pogos here, plain old Groovy objects instead of a plain old Java object, a pojo. The nice thing is, is how small this is, because if this was Java, I'd be just getting started. First of all, you may notice the absence of semicolons. Then you might notice the absence of public and private. Well, in Groovy, attributes are automatically assumed to be private. You don't have to put the word on there. You can. It, it's um, redundant, I mean, but you don't have to put it on there. Uh, and methods are automatically assumed to be public. So I didn't have to say public string to string. This is assumed to be a public method that can be accessed from anybody. 
Also, as I say, all of these attributes will generate getters and setters as needed. And as somebody said, if I want to disable that, I can simply provide one of my own that's a no-op or put final on int ID or something like that. There are ways I can work around that. Even the class is considered public by default. So Neil Ford likes to use the term essence over ceremony. Java has lots and lots of ceremony. Groovy really tries to reduce that down to just the essence. So there's my class. Now I'm going to supply name and team. Somehow I'm going to have to figure out what the latitudes and longitudes are. So here's if I was using it, I'm going to make a, this, this, uh, the purpose of this script ultimately is to populate a database table with the latitudes and longitudes. And I see that uh, when I presented this, I did a little wraparound. So I'll just explain this. And then when, when the presentation is over, I'll fix this slide to reduce the font a little bit. Uh, the idea here is I have a stadiums reference, which is an array list. That's an open and closed square bracket, if you could actually see it at a good enough magnification. So that's a java.util.array list. Groovy uses the left shift operator to append to a, to a list or any collection or even an array if you want, or even a string. There's lots of things you can use it for. So I'm instantiating stadium, and notice, let me pick these because they're all in one line. Notice the arguments to the constructor are name and team. Well, back here, you see I don't have a constructor at all. Groovy provides, you know, Java would provide me with a default constructor. Groovy provides me with a default and a, a map-based constructor. I can supply all the properties as in a map syntax, I guess I should say, and when it instantiates the stadium, it'll automatically fill all those in. So, and it doesn't matter what order I put them in because it's treating it like a map. I can do team and then name or name and then team, whatever I like. So again, it's a great simplification. So I built up this stadiums array filled with all the stadiums for all the teams, you know, all 30 teams in Major League Baseball. And then now I've got to fill in the latitudes and longitudes. The business at the bottom, by the way, that was cut off is just the stuff I ex explained. I do want to say one thing here is that in my database, the way I set it up, the IDs are auto-generated. So I don't want to supply those. And the latitudes and longitudes will be in the, saved in the database, but I've got to compute them, of course, before I add them. So here is the URL for the Google Geocoding API, and they've just switched from version 2 to version 3. Well, it's been a month or two, and I haven't ported my stuff, so I'm just going to show you version 2 stuff, and I'll come back to, you know, later I'll port it up there. Uh, the idea here is it's a free web service, handles up to 2,500 requests a day. I only have 30 stadiums, so it's not going to be a problem. And this is the idea. You send the URL, or uh, send your request to this URL. You specify whether you want JSON or XML output. So that's JavaScript object notation or XML. And then once again, you supply parameters, the address, et cetera. So here's an example. This is the one they use on the web page for Google Geocoder. There's the base URL, and I want XML. And the address is, and this, of course, is the address for Google. The thing to notice here is that the street and the city and the state are separated by comma pluses. So the street separate from the city by comma plus, and then the comma plus separates the state as well. Also, the little pluses inside here mean that the address has to be URL encoded. I can't send an address which has spaces in it. I just have to get rid of quotes or, or exclamation, you know, whatever uh, wouldn't work in a URL. So there's that information. Oh, and by the way, this sensor parameter is required by Google Geocoder to say, are you operating from a machine that has uh, is GPS enabled? And of course, right now I'm not. So if I was doing this from a handheld, I would say sensor equals true. If I do this from Android. All right, here's what I'm ultimately planning to do is take that stadiums collection and for each stadium, call it S, invoke a method called fill in lat long. If you're familiar in Java with the new for each loop, the for element colon in collection, and then it works through element by element, this is very similar. This is an each iterator built into all the collections in Groovy and lets you operate across the collection one by one. Once again, this S is just a dummy variable to say each element in the stadium's collection will be assigned to S, and then I can call methods on it. This block here, again, is a closure, and it's really the argument to the each method. It's saying apply this closure to every element in the stadium's array. If you don't say S, by the way, the default is it. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. Now let's look at the fill in lat long method. Here's my base URL. There's my params array, very much like what you saw, the sensor, the encoding. This is the time in, in Google um, Geocoder version 2, they let you specify that you wanted comma-separated values as the output. 
In version three, they don't anymore. You have to switch to XML or JSON, and that's why I haven't bothered updating this yet. Also, you have to register and get some long key. In version three, you don't need the key anymore. Nevertheless, here it is. Uh, make my URL to be the base plus question mark equals, and there's my first comma uh, plus. And this is the UR encoder, URL encoder class from Java. So I say encode the name. This is the uh, that'll be the uh, name of the stadium that'll come in using the UTF-8 encoding, and then here's that same collect structure that I used before to build the query string. This time I invoke the URL and go dot text. I could have done URL dot to URL dot text. This is equivalent. And now I get back my results and split them. Let me break this down piece by piece. So first of all, here was building up the long URL. So the base there, there's the URL encoding of the name. So it takes out all the spaces and replaces them with pluses, et cetera. And that's all pure Java. And then the collect method to build the query string from the parameters map and join them by ampersands the same exact way that I did on the earlier one. Now when you invoke this, this one line, new URL, URL dot text, returns a string. And it's a string that looks like this. Uh, double quotes, 200, comma, 4, comma, then a number and a number. The numbers are latitude and longitude. The 200 is the response code saying, yeah, that worked. Magnification is how uh, detailed it is. Like if you give an actual address, it would be like a 6. If you give a state, it would be like a 5. I did the something even bigger or whatever. I don't know. I got a certain magnification. But there's the latitude and longitude. That's what I want. On that result string, I call the split method at the comma, and that returns a list containing all the elements. And then here's the best part. I'm accessing the resulting array, the resulting list, from the right end instead of from the left end. Instead of going square bracket 0, 1, 2, 3, or what have you, say 0, 1, 2, 3, this longitude is the right end, so I use minus 2 and minus 1 to pull those out. And then, of course, I convert them to doubles because in my stadium class, I'm saving them as doubles. And there you go. So you have the ability to access arrays from the right end as well as the left end. We have a few now, questions. In yeah, go ahead. Uh, sure. First one is, do we need Java import statement for any Java utility? No. You don't need java.util. If, if what you mean is java.util package, that's automatically imported in every Groovy class, so you don't need to add the import statement at all. You can use ArrayList or what have you cleanly. Great. Uh, this may be a little bit of a repeat from before. Uh, can we create string variables using the as keyword, say, suppose string middle initial as care? Uh, that one gets a little involved, and I, let me just say the short answer is no, but there is a way to convert them to characters if you like, uh, just you wouldn't use the as keyword necessarily. Okay, and uh, finally for this round, um, so if we want to make some property read-only, only we mm -hmm. need to implement an empty setter method? Or put in a private setter method, There, you could do that. Um, or you could put in a public getter method or public setter method that does nothing. I mean, so you have multiple options for it. Great. Thank you very much, Ken. Sure. There may be another way too. I have to check. Uh, the the my definitive reference on this stuff is Groovy in action. And right now they're working on a second edition. Dear Koenig and the guys, and that's a great reference for that. But I will tell you that the Groovy website has tons of examples as well for those sorts of circumstances. And the, the various uh, email lists are extremely friendly. They're very welcoming to newcomers and everything. It's not a problem at all. Uh, but I can look that up if you want to send me email. I'll just make sure and get back to you on that if you like. OK, so let's assume that I've gone and run all my stadia through the uh, geocoder, and now I have values out of it. Now I want to put all this stuff in the database. Well, Groovy uses uh, all the regular JDBC stuff if you want, but just for simplicity, if you have a simple example, there's a class called groovy.sql.sql, capital SQL, kind of an odd name for it, but there it is. And it's got a new instance method, and you supply the URL, username, password, and the driver class as though you were writing a JDBC program, except it's just one line. Now, there are alternatives doing things like Jindy lookups and stuff like that. There's, you don't have to embed usernames and passwords in source code. There are workarounds. But for an example this simple, I just put it all together, embedded it right in here, although that's not my username and password. So once I have that SQL instance, I called it DB to represent the database connection there. Now I could do things like execute method call. This is a string argument to the method call. And I, I happen to use double quotes here. 
I could have used single quotes. That wouldn't have been a problem. Either way would have been all right. So I basically say, oh, and, and I'm using uh, MySQL syntax because I happen to be using a MySQL database for this. So drop table if exists stadiums, and then execute. And here you see triple quoted strings. Now this is three single quotes, so there couldn't be any parameter replacement in there. They also allow fend a string across multiple lines. I think Scott Davis refers to this as a here doc or whatever in his uh, Groovy Recipes book. At any rate, so I made my table called Stadium. This is going to be really simple. There's my ID, not null, auto increment. I've got a name, a team. That'll be the team abbreviation. There's my latitude and longitude, and of course the ID is the primary key. That's all there is to that. So I can execute this as part of my script, and that way when I rerun the script over and over again, it'll drop the table and, and build this. You know, th again, this is going to be something I'm going to run once. I'll show you in a minute how you extract data from the table. So now I'm going to walk through each one of the stadium, invoke the fill in last long to make sure it's got the latitude and longitude in there, and then I'll say, all right, execute, insert into stadiums, name, team, latitude, longitude, here are the values. And now this one, I'm using the three double quotes because this time I do want to do the parameter replacement. And you see I was just plugging in from the stadium reference, name, team, latitude, and longitude that I just figured out. So executing this loop, will fill in all the rows in the database from all the stadiums that it just uh, that it just populated with latitudes and longitudes. Now I want to prove that this worked and I haven't talked about testing and unfortunately we won't have a lot of time to talk about testing. Let me at least mention this. Here is a built-in assert keyword that comes with Groovy and it takes as an argument a boolean. So just to prove that these things are at least reasonable, I said db.rows, that's a method on the SQL class that returns all the rows of a table, or, or actually all the rows of result sets. See, I put in the results, the uh, query was select star from stadiums. I get back a result set as a list. Each individual row will be in a list. I call the size method on it and compare it to the stadium size. You may be familiar with the fact, if you're a Java developer, that arrays have a length property and strings have a length method and uh, Collections have a size method, and node lists have a get length method. In Groovy, you just use size everywhere, and it works in all cases. I hesitate to say that in Groovy, therefore, size matters, because that might be in a little bit poor taste, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that joke. Okay, now I want to populate, now I want to actually run my program. All of that was preliminary just to get the database populated. This is a segment out of the actual Groovy baseball program. I have a map to hold the various stadium uh, instances. And I'm going to key them off of the name, the team abbreviation. So I said, let's make that SQL instance, and I'll select all the rows from the stadiums, and now this each row iterator is like each, but it'll work row by row as an object. Call each row a row, and I'll say home is row dot team. That'll grab the, the value of the column called team in that particular row. I want to save that in the map under that name, make a new stadium with where the name is row.name and team uh, is uh, home, that's that home part here, and the latitude is row.latitude and the longitude is row.longitude. Sorry the formatting got a little messed up here, it looks cleaner in the code itself. This loop right here basically is part of my startup for the program. It reads all the data out of the stadiums and populates um, it creates a stadium instance for each one of the rows and then populates the map so that they're all keyed under the team name. And there we go. All right, now what about the data itself, the box scores? Well, it turns out that Major League Baseball makes box score data available in XML form. Now, this is the URL, and if I, I actually have Firefox open for this one because, unfortunately, um, uh, Chrome doesn't show the XML data very easily. This is that URL. And if I scroll down to, say, this year, see how they append a year onto it, and then I can go into a month. Uh, and actually, I didn't want to, yeah, that's this month. And then if I go to this day, is that the one where the, uh, it should have been a perfect game, the Cleveland against Detroit, and the umpire blew the call, and Andres, uh, the guy didn't get his perfect game out of it. At any rate, here's the box score itself, and you see it's all in XML form. I hope that's big enough to read. Let me make that a little bit bigger. I can increase the font size. There. Good. So you see the root element is box score, and there's a ton of attributes. And then there's a line score going through the inning. And then there's pitching, which has pitcher. You see, oh, that's Carmona. I got the wrong game, didn't I? I want to go to, uh, let's try the third, I guess it was. And where's the Detroit? There, is this the one? 
uh, I missed the picture. Uh, well, sorry about the no, the perfect game miss. I'll just, I'll just stick with this one for the moment. Anyway, see the line score, and there's a pitching element that has a bunch of pitchers in it. They used a lot of pitchers in this particular game. And then batting, which has all the batters, and then some extra information. And then the same stuff for the away, for the home team, rather. See, team flag here is home, and on and on. And text data and extra game info, and there's the whole box score. That's available online anytime you want it. So, of course, I want to go access that, download it, and then process the XML. Now, in Java, that would be very painful. So here's a snapshot just to show you what the web page looks like. There's the rough idea of what the box score looks like, some for the home team, some for the away, deeper XML structure with attributes and child elements, etc. Now, working with XML in Java is painful. You can do a SACS parser or, a, this is what I'm saying, maybe a document builder factory, new instance, get a new document builder and parse it. Then you've got to either traverse the XML, which gets into all kinds of problems with white space and everything, or you can call get element by ID if the elements have an ID, which of course you, you might have noticed in there they did not, or you call get elements by tag name, which returns a node list that you then have to parse again. It's very painful no matter how you do it. Well, let's do this in Groovy. Groovy, I said new XML parser. There's also something called an XML slurper, and I called parse with the URL. Done. That's it. Now I've got the, it went over the internet, whatever the URL was, it was an HTTP URL, went over the web, downloaded the file, parsed it into XML, and now I've got my root element. So that's the whole parsing. Now if I want to grab the name of the away team, it turned out that was an attribute on the root element. So away F name was the away name. Uh, to get the score of the away team, I go box score dot line score, the, the root, the zeroth element of that, and then I want the away team runs as an attribute of it. And the same thing for the home score. And that's, that's all you have to do. I mean, I, anytime I have to do something with XML in a Java program, I usually add, if I can, a Groovy module to go do it in Groovy and then just return the results. Because this is so much simpler than doing it the way you would do it in Java. At any rate, here's a little bit more complicated just to show something interesting. Uh, box score is the root element. Pitching was a child. Pitcher was a child of that. This grabs all the pitcher elements throughout the document that are children of pitching. All of them. So I say walk through each one. Call it P. If P has an attribute called note, and that note matches this regular expression, the forward slash is our regular expression, capital W or capital L or capital S for win, loss, or save, then just print out the name of the pitcher and what the note was, wins, losses, or saves. So this would be an easy way to find out who won, who lost, and who got the save for it. They call this the slashy syntax, and it uses regular expressions. Now, Java's had regular expressions since version 1.4, but a lot of people don't use them. Groovy makes it easier to use because you don't have to double escape things all the time if you're using the forward slash syntax. Now, what output do I actually want? Well, I want to plot the game scores on a Google map. So I needed the latitude and longitude. Uh, but the thing is, is it's JavaScript that's going to process the results of this mess. And I can't give Java objects to JavaScript. JavaScript can't read Java objects or Groovy objects, for that matter. I have to send JavaScript either strings or JavaScript object notation, JSON, or XML. I'm going to generate XML because it's trivial. It's another one of the built-in builders. Here is a class to hold those results. The home team, the away team, the home team score, the away team score, and a reference to the stadium because that's where the latitude and longitude lives. And I overrode to string just so I could see it. So this is the container for the results. Here is a script that uses a markup builder. Before I used that swing builder, groovy.swing.swing builder. This is building builder. So I go at xml.games, and that will become an, an, uh, an element. Uh, results dot each results was the collection of uh, output that I got from the uh, parsing the data for each one call the game G write the word game parentheses and make out outcome that I'd have an outcome attribute is away comma away score home comma home score and then there's the latitude and longitude notice I have to go through the stadium to get those these are by the way it looks like property access but it's really doing g dot get stadium dot get latitude or g dot get stadium dot get longitude and when you do that this is what you get so it maps this games game and properties outcome latin long all become XML, XML, and attributes on the XML.
because of the way I set it up. And that's what I send to JavaScript, which can just walk through this with, with ease. JavaScript parses XML is about as well as Groovy does. It's only Java that doesn't do a good job with it. And then I simply use the Google map to take the, you know, to plot each of these at the proper latitude and longitude. And that outcome is the, uh, is what I'm seeing in this little info window. See? So that was the outcome part. Uh, away team, away team score, comma, home team, home team score plotted inside there. And that's pretty much the application, which leaves you time for monster seeds. Uh, I always told my wife that one time in my life I was actually going to get monster seats at Fenway. This is at Fenway Park. I went a couple of years ago, and that's my, that's my son who's 18 now, and there's a picture. It's an old picture. I'm sure I have, I've lost so much weight since then. Let's just move on. Okay, let me give you some conclusions for all this because we're wrapping up now. Uh, Groovy is a, is a dynamically typed or optionally typed language that compiles to Java bytecodes, works freely with Java, has a syntax that's similar to Java. I, used, I tried to use as, as Groovy-like syntax as possible, but there are a lot of Java programs. You can just replace the .java with .groovy and it works automatically. Uh, and then, there's, um, then you can make it groovier over time, if you will. That's the phrase people tend to use. But it also goes beyond. It has closures and iterators and those builders and also metaprogramming to make domain-specific languages and everything, and there you go. Now, of course, the immediate question in some of your minds is, wait a minute, what about Grails? That's supposed to be the killer application for Groovy, right? So let me just give you one slide here on Grails. Grails is basically a framework. It started off as a web framework. It's got more power now, but let's treat it as a web framework that uses Groovy domain-specific languages to unite Spring Framework and Hibernate Framework and Site Mesh for the View and many others. Now when I say domain specific languages, I mean that it defines words like has many to represent that if the department has many employees, there's a one to many relationship. This will work with Hibernate. Or belongs to, to say that an employee belongs to a department and if I delete the department, I wind up deleting the employees as well, which doesn't sound like a good idea actually, but nevertheless, you know, well, that's all part of Grails. It's designed for web applications. They've got it's a pluggable architecture. There are over 200 plugins available now on all sorts of things. That'll be the subject of our next webinar, which we hope to do sometime in July. We'll talk all about that when we get there. So you have to stay tuned for that.